Good evening world, we're here. It's Wildlife Aid, I think that's who I work for. Let me just check my name badge. Oh yes, I do, Wildlife Aid. And uh, we've got a new guest, so we've got a threesome tonight. I wish I hadn't just said that actually. So we've got Laurie, smiling nervously. We've got Tom Hines, who is a friend of Wildlife Aid, doesn't know a lot about wildlife, so he says. I think he does actually, he's lying. <laughs> um, and he's gonna be asking me questions. And he does a bit of, bit of media work in his spare time, so I know nothing about media. Um, I've learned how to spell it now, so that'll be quite cool. Um, so I'm going to firstly say, Tom, good evening. Welcome. Good evening, Simon. Thank um, you very we much. We both have looked after cameras, Exciting. don't we? Because I always forget, but never mind. You do. Um, you are looking completely yeah. off screen. It's not professional, Simon. I'm, I'm looking at your face, Lauren. It's really putting me right off doing the whole no thing. No one wants to do that. I'd recommend otherwise. No, I think I might put a little bit of paper over your, your bit of screen and I shan't have that to That works it. well. <laughs> that works well. So, Tom, welcome. Good. Welcome Thank to the you. wonderful, Thank insane you. world of Wildlife Aid. Um, and uh, yeah, it's uh, as you can see from everybody is watching us now tonight. It all looks really professional and neat. And if you saw the wires all over the office to make this happen, it's going to be quite interesting. And also, oh, if, it, if, you, if, if, it, if I'm just if I'm looking distractedly off camera, it's because I've got a loud voice in my right ear. A loud voice. <laughs> Who's that? Well, any loud voices? <laughs> just just kill them off, Tom. Kill them off. You don't need loud voices. That's awful. So, Tom, tell us all about yourself. Come on, give us a praise. So I am. Um, yeah, I, I, I know um, incredibly little about wildlife, so I'm, I'm not quite sure. Not quite sure what qualifies me to be here. Join the club. Um, You're fine. Other than that, uh, no, I'm, I'm, I'm a, a, a big fan of um, nature and the outdoors, and it's where I, where I feel uh, calmest. Which I think probably most of us would, would say, um, but uh, yeah, know very little about wildlife, so I'm I'm here to ask stupid questions, basically. Stupid questions are good, but I mean, you, you say you know you don't do anything to do with wildlife really. You're interested in, in wildlife. Mm. Why do you feel so connected when you're out in the outdoors? What makes you feel calm or relaxed or whatever it does make you feel? Um, that is a very good question. I think it's the pace of it. I think part of it is the pace of it. You know, I think the pace. The, the pace of the world changes when you're um, when you're in nature. Everything moves slower. Everything has its place as well. You know the the, the things that fit together in nature fit together because um, uh, they have fitted together for hundreds and thousands of years. There's no you know the, the kind of the, the forced patterns that we put on with commuting and working and everyday life and those sorts of things. They they don't exist in nature. Um, and also the the um, the changes as well, the, the kind of the, the rate of the change and um, slow changes between seasons and, and uh, seeing things die off and regenerate and, and fill the space they used to be in and um, uh, and all of the, the kind of the, the harmony that comes with that, I suppose. Heaven, that was a bit deep. That was Thanks, man. very, very deep, <laughs> very deep. Um, far, far more deep than we usually go, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. I, 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 I was, I was, I was expecting, been that deep my entire life. <laughs> It's quite scary, actually. I think this could be quite a serious evening, guys. <laughs> um, I, and I, all, I do vow by the end of the evening we're going to have Tom saying, I dot, I dot, I dot food chain. It will happen because he's already nearly there. I can, I can feel it on the edge of his breath now. Well, I keep, I keep, re uh, I keep misreading it as idiot, which is, um, which is far more fitting. For, uh, no, that's what you call me. For, for, you the, call chair, me an for idiot. the chair that I'm sitting in. Well, there we are. So, no, I mean, nature does connect you. It also relaxes you down. I mean, anybody who's got a dog or any pets, you know, you had a real stressed day, you sit down in the chair in the evening and you stroke the dog, you choke the cat. It honestly does take an amazing amount of stress out of you. And just sitting in a, a quiet field, either by a river or wherever you are, and just watching what's going on, it'll, it'll make itself known to you at its pace and you just sit and enjoy it. So, yeah, it, it's a big thing. I was hoping COVID might have had more effect. And perhaps now we're just about to go in another semi-lockdown, guys, in the UK, just so you know. Um, it, it's gonna, hopefully it'll start to come back again. I'm hoping that COVID does make this, my, my famous word I love using, or my famous two words, which is paradigm shift. We need that shift and nobody on all these chats has ever come and talked to me about a paradigm shift. So tonight, guys, this is your chance. I'm not allowed to say guys. <gasps> oh, my daughter will be so cross with me. Um, you say guys your chance. far too many times. I know, I do, but I do that. And what's the other thing I always say, Laurie, on rescues, which everybody gets right. excited about? Right. Right. We right. have a right count yeah. on your videos. We're thinking of implementing an actual tally number now because people <laughs> in the comments will regularly tally up your rights. And the number is quite But you know why that is, Laurie? You know why that is, don't you? Well, you're telling I me am you actually always right. Um, 
There, there, there are no words. There are no words that can... Oh, you've got a screen now. That's really annoying. I was going to write uh, you a note, but unfortunately you've got a screen now. Oh yeah, you can yeah. see his notes now. See what's going on. So, so no. when, when things like this appear on screen, unfortunately, um, you, you are always right, Simon. You are definitely always right. I uh, am that right. That has never changed. Oh, Laurie. I miss the days it's, when you couldn't see what I was doing. It's a very short career chain here for Laurie. So Tom, let's go back to you because we have, we've never had you on this chat before. Mm. Uh, we're going to have, in a couple of weeks time, hopefully guy, uh, guys, I can't say that either, uh, we're going to have Lucy back. So Lucy is in the country. Um, she is going to try and get down here for, for one of these live chats. We had a chat with her probably about, I don't know, six months ago, Laurie now, maybe a year even. Long time. Yeah, it's a long um, time, long time. So she, she will be back abusing me as she always used to. Let's hope she's uh, sober this time. Uh, so, why is Lucy speak saying, hi, Jean-Luc Picard? She obviously thinks, Tom, that you are looking a bit like a very young young version, I hate to add, Jean-Luc Picard. Um, yeah, to me, you just look like a slightly rough version of, um, who's that actor I keep referring to you as? Oh. I don't know. Oh, love, love flattered, actually. Flattered or offended, Hugh Grant. It? Hugh Grant. He looks a bit like Hugh Grant. Please, come onto your screens now and tell me if you think that Tom looks a little bit like Hugh Grant. With the lockdown beard. With the lockdown beard, that's lockdown it, that's the one. There. So, come on, let's talk a bit more. Ask me any questions. Tell me your innermost thoughts. My innermost thoughts? Yeah. Um, uh, what have I been thinking? So I normally, uh, my day job is in sport uh, and sport media, which um, uh, is pretty detached from what I like. Um, but coming on it, I, I was having a think about what, about kind of where sport and wildlife um, uh, intersect. And um, there was, I used to work for England Rugby a few years ago, and they had these, these whacking great lamps that they put on the pitch at night, which kind of encourages the growth of the grass, especially in the wintertime and all that sort of stuff. Um, and there was a, a family of foxes that took to sleeping under the lamps every night which was great and very cute and we named them because we used to work in the stadium and, and look out over the pitch and all that kind of thing. Um, and we all loved it, um, everyone except for the, um, the groundsman who had to go out on the morning of the match. Yeah. And <laughs> a bit of poo clearing to be done, was Pick up the deliveries, yeah. Bit of poo clearing. Yeah, exactly. Um, you, you want to work here, if you want to know what poo clearing is all about, come and do a morning here. We worked out actually, I was talking to Laurie today because we're going to put, put, put a new ask out soon for something for the uh, winter. And for our overwintering hedgehogs, of which we overwinter anything from 200 upwards, we actually worked out that over the winter they would eat between them seven tons of food. Now you and I all know what goes in must come out. So somewhere over that winter our poor volunteers have to <laughs> clear seven tons of hedgehog poo. Now I leave you with that thought guys, what more can I say? Look, we've got lots of hearts coming up, and they're all for you, Tom. It's really upsetting. We've got lots of hearts in the chat. I'm not convinced. Uh, That's not for me. So there we are. So there. So so hedgehog poop. So you. Yeah, so oh, hang on, hang on a second. Sorry, we've got uh, Simon. If Tom looks like Hugh Grant, then Laurie looks like. <laughs> I could answer that so easily. <laughs> so many things spring to mind. Be careful. Okay, well, I have the power to remove you from the live stream. If you want to, that's fine. I can go and have another drink, and I'll be quite happy. It could be Tom and you, and I'll just go and have a drink. I'll sit down. I'm getting very old now, so it doesn't make a lot of odds whether I'm here or not, really. <laughs> so, so I'm trying to read stuff as I go. So when my eyes go from there across to there, it's because I'm reading the chat that's going on. She, she's quite busy. We haven't asked for any money yet, though. You know me. I'm terrible. Everybody gets very upset. I always ask for money. Every can of food you give us money for, so every 50p you give us, will feed a hedgehog for probably two, nearly two days. And we're going to overwinter over 200 hedgehogs um, and they'll be with us for 150 days. And believe it or not, that equates to, well, every 100 hedgehogs equates to 1,500 cans, doesn't it? So yeah, nearly seven tons of food will go to the hedgehogs over winter. So anything you can help with that, they'll all be here. They'll all be kept to weight. The big thing with why we overwinter hedgehogs is because if they're under 600 grams, they would go into hibernation okay, but they would never come out the other end because they haven't built up enough body fat to go into hibernation. Whether that's the case nowadays, there's a lot of talk about hedgehogs at the moment and global warming because the winters aren't nearly so severe as they used to be, so hedgehogs don't hibernate so quickly. 
but the downside of that, you know, the second brood hedgehogs which come along within the next month or so, um, will they be finding enough food in the wild? Because some animals will have started to go underground that time of year. So this is a big thing. Is global warming going to be good for the hedgehogs or bad? And none of us, even the experts, of which I'm certainly not, know the answer. So does that mean that they'll need more support or less support from us? We don't know, because you know, the, basically the second brood hedgehogs get born, they get to about three or 400 grams, it gets very cold, they go into hibernation, they don't wake up the other side of it. So we don't know whether that's going to be a good thing or a bad thing that the weather stays warmer. It depends whether they're finding enough food in the wild uh, to sustain themselves or whether there's going to be a shortage of food for them to eat. So it's all a bit up in the air, rather like rather like our political situation at the moment. But we always promise not to talk about politics, so I better steer off that one quite quickly. Tom, say something quickly before I, before um, I say... Look, some, hang on, no, I'm going to stop you, Tom, because somebody's just said I'm going to donate £500, and if that person is being honest, I love you to pieces. Whoever it is, it's Vanita, 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 I apologise if I got the name wrong. Uh, you've been saying quite a few bits up above us, and I can't read the stream and do what I do, but um, anybody donates tonight, obviously every penny counts. It's so important to us to get money in. And it's sad, really. I chatted with a chap today, he said, you know, why do you run a charity? It's all easy for you, isn't it? What you've got to think about running a charity is that for the more successful we are, the more work we do, and so therefore the more money we lose. <coughs> if Tom's job is successful in, in, in his, his work with Arsenal, then obviously they make money. Um, sadly, the more successful we are, we lose money. So it would really be helpful if we were really unsuccessful and never actually took patients through. Have you ever thought about that, Tom Hines? Sounds, sounds, uh, no, I haven't. Sounds like Great, that's the end of that commentary. I'll throw that piece of paper out the door. Be less successful. <laughs> yeah, be less successful. That, that's my motto in life. I've managed to do it 68 years being very unsuccessful, so why change the habits of a lifetime? Guy, shut up now, Tom. I'm going to shut up. Speak to me. No, well, we've got a running order, haven't we? Yeah, have we? Apparently these things are planned. I never used to get silly. Poor Laurie. He struggles. Hey, look, he's, he's giving me a running order here, look. I never look at it. He gets gets so cross with me. So, all right, let's do patient admissions, because that'll make him feel happy. Laurie, we've, 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 we've got a mole in a hole. No, we haven't. We've got a mole in the road. Talk to me, Laurie, about a mole in the road. Uh, the, the patience it takes to do one of these live streams. I think Laurie's <laughs> given up. So, mole. Um, we don't usually get moles here at the centre, but uh, we actually had a number of them. This one was found just down the road from the centre, wandering around in the middle of the road. Uh, definitely not, not somewhere a mole should be. Uh, was brought in, was assessed, um, was quite sort of thin, weak, very dehydrated, has undergone treatment uh, and has come out the other side on that one. But one of the more unusual species that we see here. Now, has he gone uh, back down his hole, Laurie, now? Uh, I'm not sure. I'm not 100% sure at the moment, I have to say. Uh, I would have to check on that one. But in terms of other strange species, we had like Laurie. this thing arrive as well. So this is a brown long-eared bat, probably my favourite. It's not a great crested newt. You see, this is why Richard <laughs> Gervais said that you have no idea that, what you're doing. That's one, of your, that's one of your flying otters, isn't it, Laurie? <laughs> oh yeah, I forgot about that. Well done, Tom. Uh, yes, I, I, I want to see the embarrassment on Laurie's face with his flying otters. You're oh, never going to live that down, Laurie, you know that. I, I've never actually uh, managed to get back into Photoshop to do it. I will do it. On one of these live streams, we will have a flying otter, and it will be the introductory thing, and we'll say nothing else about it. And <laughs> it depends on whether you've been in enough of the live stream to get the little reference. Because if people ask, why is there an otter with wings, we're not going to explain it at all. Tim, You'll Tim. have to have been uh, regular to know what the reference is. I, I, I know a flying something else, but I'm not allowed to say that on, on, on a live, live broadcast, so we'll just stay with flying otters, I think. Yes. Anyway, yes. so this is a brown long-eared bat, uh, and it's actually one of two that have arrived with us over the past week. Uh, we usually get common pipistrelles, soprano pipistrelles. Uh, we tend not to get that many long ears. Um, Laurie, we had two Laurie, could you just tell me, the same. Laurie, could you just tell me why the long-eared bat's smoking a cigar? It's not smoking a cigar, that's a mealworm, and she oh, was enjoying okay. it immensely. Um, but we don't usually get that many of them. We had two, all found on the ground in a barn. Uh, both were quite dehydrated and thin. One, unfortunately, didn't make it. It had a really nasty fracture to uh, the lower jaw. Um, but the, the female was doing really, really well, and has now been transferred to a bat carer for uh, 
full-time care and last time I uh, heard they were doing very well so so that so when you then, so when you get um, backs in for example so that presumably that's about that that will kind of fit in the palm of your hand right that long ear bat it will yeah you so have to wear a glove never handle a bat without gloves just in case but it was well, they're tiny I mean there there's I mean a pipistral bat can go through a, a, a gap of half half a, half an inch I mean tiny gaps they can get into tiny places and when we go out Laurie and I go out quite often because somebody's got a bat flying around their room and we can spend hours just trying to find it because it'll, it'll creep up in the smallest little gap and although we have a bat detector so we can hear its sounds which gives us some sort of clue mm. it's really very very difficult so bats a tiny little thing especially the pipistral bats which are the smallest ones um, but they're very cute and you know everybody's for some unknown reason really scared of bats I think it's, it's all this sort of you know the the, the, the sort of horror movies of bats in belfries and whatever, but they're really quite cute. They avoid us. They've got awful icy sight, but amazing hearing, all by sonar, amazing hearing capabilities. So, yeah, we go out to quite a few bats over the year, don't we, Laurie, I think? We do, yeah. Um, as I said, the, the vast majority of ones we do are the pipistrelle bats, which are probably the most common bat species we see where we are in the UK. Um, but we have seen a multitude of others. We've seen Nethusius bats, we've seen Soprano pipistrels, Common pipistrels, um, we've seen um, a Whiskered bat, a Brant's bat, uh, a whole vast menagerie, uh, and a lot of them I can't tell apart, so we rely on the uh, bat experts to, to get the fine details. We can tell a long ear bat apart, that one's quite obvious, but other than that, so, so, what else then, had then, but then so then they're brought back here, and they go and they go to the vets. And it's and one of the things that always strikes me about what you guys do is, if you're a, if you're a doctor, then you can you ask your patient how they're feeling, right? That's that's how the diagnosis works. If you're a if you're a vet for domestic animals, then you ask the owner what they've seen in the animal. If you're a wildlife vet, you don't have any of that to go on, right? You you have this incredibly small you know bat that fits in the palm of your hand. You've got to diagnose and and treat at that scale I mean that's that's an incredible yeah. I think this we have several it? of our vet team that are actually fluent in bat so <laughs> they can sort of converse and try and work out what it is it's a really specialist art I think uh, and they are actually flying bats Laurie aren't they they are they are I think they, they get they a swimming bat flying next. mammals I think a swimming bat next I mean I think the one thing that the vets here and we all have here the thing which is more difficult and different from any vet in a commercial practice is that although the animals can't talk to you, sadly, I wish they could, you know, at least that the, the, the owners can tell us roughly what happened to that animal when it came in, what probably caused the problem. When we get a wild animal in, we've no idea of the history at all. We're guessing and we're trying to work it out from things we see on the animal, how the animal smells, what's going on. We have no idea what caused that injury to that animal. So we're really working totally in the dark, more so than a normal vet practice. So Is that a bat pump? Our vets have to be really, really forensic scientists as much as anything. That's not the conversation, Stone Dead. <laughs> there there are a number, a oh, number of uh, comments that have been said in the chat about bats in general, uh, including one from uh, Lou, our deputy CEO, that's just written, Tom knows a lot about bats, go on, ask him. <laughs> is that because Tom is bats or yes, because no. he just knows a lot about them? <laughs> yeah, they're the, um, they're the flying mouse ones, aren't they? With the, with the flappy bits under their arms. <laughs> flappy bits yeah. under their arms. That's the bat. That's Th the that end pretty of much sums it they up. Do the, they do the air running. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, in terms of questions, uh, Pinky's asked, what's the smallest bat species we've seen? I think it's the pipistrelle. Is that right, Laurie, or are you going to prove me yeah. wrong? It'll be the soprano pipistrelle, I think, is the smallest that we've seen. Yeah. Uh, get a lot of pipistrelles, but the sopranos are very slightly smaller usually. I think it's the falsetto pipistrelle actually, Laurie. I think it's it's smaller than the, the baritone pipistrelle. The baritone <laughs> pipistrelle. We get quite a few bats in. We've got people who care for them. Sometimes they need much more rehab than we can give them, and they need big areas to fly in. But I mean, we we will pass them any animal that comes in here that we don't have exactly the right facilities for. Like sometimes when we get a peregrine falcon in. It needs a bit of flight training after it leaves us, and we need people with a, a massively long flight that's about at least two, 200 feet long. I mean, they're big flights, so they can really get their strength back. So we will pass animals across to other centres if we need to, as they will pass the initial treatment to us first to get the treatment done before they rehab it. So there's a lot of work done 
between the charities. There's a lot of work where we actually talk to each other, we help each other out all the time. We've had some massive help recently from a, a charity up in Essex. So all these people, thank you so much for everything you do for us, it's great. Do we leave it to Tom again now and I, I can have another slurp of drink? Well, that facts. <laughs> Uh, um, there were a few people saying that there's uh, a, a fan hitting a microphone. I'm not sure if your heater's kicked in or anything, Tom, um, Tom Simon, anyone around there? No, I've got uh, nothing hitting anything here. Me. Oh, okay, we're miles away from anything. Okay. Weird tapping. Very weird. We're all voice. listening. We've all gone quiet because we're listening, but I can't Sounds hear anything. Sounds like a going. fan on a microphone. No, we've got no fans near any microphones at all. Okay. Vibration sound. People are just laughing at you. So it's like <laughs> <laughs> I think it's the flying otter. It got it got too yeah. close to the mic. I think we might have a flying otter in the in the in the uh, in the belfry. That's the flying. Uh, that's something I'm definitely not going to live down, is it? Okay. No, you, so you're I'll never going to get away. Sorry, I'll that. do my best with my bat ignorance, but I I don't think I can dig you out of that one. <laughs> Uh, a few people are asking, how is it best to work out uh, if you do have bats at night? Um, you will see that if you stand out in your garden at night and look up with just a torchlight or something, you will see them flittering around. They're very quick um, and you'll see them, I mean I have an outside light, if you turn your outside light on you'll often see them looking around. If you've got an outside pond, um, they will always come down because there's lots of little creatures flying above the ponds, mosquitoes, gnats, whatever, they fly above and that's what they eat. Uh, even a little bat, like a pipistrel, can eat up to 3,000 little tiny insects a night. So they have to be very active. They've got a lot of work to do to feed themselves. Um, so if you've got a little outside pond, I mean, I was up to my top pond the other week, and I was absolutely amazed to see the bats actually flying right down to within half an inch of the water and flying off again. I'd never seen that before, and that was fascinating. This is why, you know, when, Tom, you go out and look at nature, you look at things like that sometimes, it's absolutely enlightening um, as to the the ability of, of natural animals, how they survive, how they survive are invasive species because man's done nothing but bad for all our wildlife everywhere. Um, they're incredible and it's incredible to watch them and it does actually bring you back to earth with a big bang to be honest. And they, don't they, they, um, they'll fly a really long way to feeding sites each night won't they? That's, is that right? I only invite people who don't ask me questions I don't know the answer to but of course I always know that Laurie will know the answer. Oh, was that, it's, a little, it's a little head shake up going on there. <laughs> okay, just move oh, on very no, fast no, to I'm, something else. I'm, well, I'm just, what was I'm the just question? Making sorry? Up, I'm, I'm just, making I was just up trying to work out what the noise was. Spurious wildlife facts. Um, uh, bats, they'll fly, they'll fly a, a long way to feed, won't they? Every night? They can do. They don't always feed I think, their... Yeah, I'm not sure of uh, specific distances, but they can fly quite a, a reasonable way. And a bat has to reach some, some obscene amounts of insects a night in terms of its for its body weight. They're, they're quite also, remarkable creatures, really. Like most animals, they all know their territory, so if we get a bat in, we always try to release it really, really close to where it was found, because it'll know where its territory is, it'll know where it finds food, it'll know where it roosts, and it's really important to get adult animals back to where they were found. Very vital and part of our work. With the youngsters, it's not quite so important, because they haven't got a territory yet, but even then, the bat groups will then go into quite a lot of detail, and maybe even soft-releasing some bats to make sure that they know where they can go to, they know where they're safe and they know where they can feed. Laurie's nodding his head, that's got to be a good sign Tom. I think so. Is that a good sign? I think you answered the question. Yeah. Come on Tom, off you go again. Um, I'm still trying to work out what this fan is. Um, I, th I, with th this I think no I fan or anything. I something it could me. be, I mean if Abby wants to whiz in here very quickly and turn our overhead fans off. They're always on to be honest and we'd never turn them off but if it is making noise for some reason maybe because Tom, maybe Tom's mic is closer to the fans than I am. Um, that one at the end there. No, that one at the end. Where are you going? No, there'll be the fans up it's there. That. So. It's that. It's we will sort this. We've got a tapping inside. We've, 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 we've got a bat in the mic. What's so, so whilst all this is going on, I'll just run through a couple of the, the questions that have come in. Um, so, in terms of what's that noise, we're not sure. We're trying to work it out at the moment. Um, Sven has entered the chats for those uh, 
those of you who know Sven, so FXP1688, better known as Sven, is a qu quite a regular on this channel, donates to us every quite single a regular. time. Quite a regular, he lives Huge on this thank channel. You. He, he really lives does. here, doesn't he? He doesn't ever he's, go away. Uh, he's donated yet another 100 euros and has put, My calendar's arrived. Thanks a lot. FYI, the noise is still there. Sounds like a fan. Um, please let us know if that noise is still there. We've tried to change around a couple of things. Uh, we will try and see what we can turn off to see if, if it is anything. I can't hear anything in here, unfortunately, that uh, would be making that noise. So I guess it's coming from in there, but we'll try and work on that one. Uh, and huge I think, Tom, perhaps again, we should turn Laurie on. The donation. I tell you what, no, I, I, just, I just went and, um, and took, the, took the sound off the live stream, and it was really annoying. So is it it's from that camera? It's from that camera, yeah. Okay. Okay, so we need to get um, rid of this camera next time, Laurie. That camera's got to go. That which camera, cam sorry? The, 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 the webcam on top of uh, Tom's computer. Tom's camera. That's what's making the noise. Uh, okay, well, I can deal with that one quite easily, just by making mm -hmm. the audio on that one. Uh, give me a second. To but then we won't hear Talk Tom. amongst yourselves. We're uh, talking amongst ourselves. Go, go through the chat actually. and see what you can find. Right, let's dive in. What have we got? Dive in. Something. So, okay, we can't. Okay, okay so uh, Laurie actually mentioned because uh, Sven very kindly said that um, he's got his calendar. We've got our 2021 calendar. It's now for sale. It's already out there. Sven has bought the first 5,000. Um, and the pictures are taken by Abby and Laurie. So, you know, our own in-house masters at this sort of thing. I took a whole picture, a whole calendar full and they just threw it away. They said it was too much soft focus for them. I mean, I like to take things in soft focus, it's more moody, but no, they use their own images. So that's how it goes. But no, a great calendar, lovely images. Thanks to Abby and Laurie. So anybody who wants to buy a 2021 calendar can do so. And also out and about now for anybody, I suppose, particularly in England, is we've got our Christmas raffle running. Um, that's going to be drawn on the 14th of December. So if anybody wants to buy raffle tickets, tickets, if you can take raffle tickets round to your company and get lots of money in, it's one of our big fundraisers. It helps us raise money. And of course, obviously this year, we've had a loss of donations. We've had no open day. So anything will really help. We're lucky we're doing well. We're doing absolutely fine, guys. Um, we haven't stopped at all, but obviously, any charity always needs fun to, funds to survive. So I actually only asked Tom on tonight because I thought he was incredibly wealthy um, and I thought he was going to give us a huge check. And I've just found out secretly in my right ear that he's not wealthy at all. So he won't be coming on this live stream ever again. Sorry, Tom. Bye bye, Tom. It's been fun. It's been fun. It's been nice <laughs> knowing you. <laughs> Uh, on the uh, the sort of money front, we need to go through a couple of donations. We've had a lot of donations for this one, so thank you to every single one of you who has. Uh, Lisa Sargent has donated five pounds. Has put thank you so much for your videos. They're all fab. Thank you very much. That's very kind. Uh, Alina Harris has donated four pounds ninety nine with a little good job. So thank you very much as well. Uh, J H has donated three ninety nine in U S dollars. Thank you very much to you. Uh, Adam Warner. The, uh, the husband of the person sat to my right, Abby, uh, has donated £9.99. Uh, hasn't written anything on there, but I'm sure you'll have something to say about it. Thank you very much. Yeah, but that means they won't be able to eat next. That means they won't be able to eat on Friday because that £9.99 is their sort of daily food budget, isn't it? So one day this week they won't be able to eat. I, I'm sorry, Adam. That's just how the cookie that, crumbles. That's dedication there, Simon. Yeah, it is. It's dedication. Dedication from your own team. They're willing to sacrifice team. eating to keep you going. <laughs> and we know it's going to the Simon Barbados Fund. That's it. That's where it's going. I've only ever got five pounds into that. I launched a that fund, uh, Tom, a few months ago saying when we started doing this, I said, we're going to have the Wildlife Aid Fund, but we're going to have the Simon Cowell Barbados Fund so I can go on holiday. And we've only ever had five pounds. That's all I've ever been donated. So I don't think it gets me out the drive for a taxi. So did you start that or did Laurie start No, I started that one. Laurie, tell me about a fox. I, this was your favourite rescue of the, the month, wasn't it? A fox under a rubbish compactor. That was quite interesting. Ah, uh, yes. Yeah, or do the, you want uh, me to start it off because you won't say the truth, will you? You're lying. Oh, I, I will say the truth. Okay, off we go. Laurie, you start my disappointment. I'll, I'll stop you if I need to. <laughs> uh, so, uh, I think it's last week, actually. We were called out to a shopping centre where a, a fox with quite bad mange had been seen cowering under a, a rubbish compactor. Um, so we were trying to find it for ages and seeing if we could find it. And eventually we found it right at the back of um, this sort of tiny gap underneath the compactor. Curled up, um, we had to go under it to try and rescue it. Laurie, let me just qualify that. Place. Two things. Firstly, that picture doesn't do it justice. 
and B, when you said we had to go under the compactor, I took one look at that gap and thought, Laurie, that's yours. I'm not going under there. Because that's you can see him gone in from the front end where he's just got room to move. But what you can't see that clearly is in the middle of that compactor, there's a beam that came down about another seven or eight inches. And for Laurie to get under that was a, a real feat. And there was broken glass, there was mess, there was probably things we don't want to think about under that compactor. But I sent Laurie. I thought he's younger, he can cope with that, and he did, he did incredibly well. Now you can finish the story, Laurie, and show the, where the real praise is needed. <laughs> yes, so um, I crawled under it, managed to uh, get a net under, made the fox move, um, tried to get a grasp around it, and as I was going towards it, the fox found an entrance that we hadn't found before, and disappeared out, right to where Simon was. So after all of that, uh, I think you actually, you drove it back in and then it was driven back out again. And then as it came out, Simon was ready and waiting and got it in the grasper. And I have to say, I've never been so disappointed by a shout of, I've got it in my entire life. And I'm not sure, there was a camera on my face at that point. So I'm not sure if you, you see just the crushing disappointment of having crawled under there for no reason whatsoever. They did. To but be honest, these rescues are always a team effort. I mean, it was going under the compactor, it was coming out, it was looking, it was going back as soon as it saw me. So the trick of all these things is one of us is going to get it, Laurie or I will get it, but seeing how it was behaving, and like all these rescues, you've just got to think in the time, you've got to think what's going on. So I saw where this thing, there's one place where it was sticking its head out to, to escape from Laurie. So I let it go back into Laurie, then I put my grasper right around the outside of that gap where it could get to, so it couldn't actually see my grasper there. Then Laurie pushed it out again, and when it stuck its head out, it didn't see the grasper, I could get the grasper very quickly around its neck, and, and I could contain it. So it, it's a team effort. All these things are a team effort. It, it doesn't, you know, it takes one person to catch it, and Laurie's, yeah, we won't talk about the one that Laurie did so brilliantly the other week. I'm still upset about that one as well. He got a duck that I didn't think he was going to get. But yeah, it's a team effort. It takes two. One of us will get it, but it takes both of us to be doing what we're doing to actually get it in the first place. So hats off to everybody. Team effort, guys. And there's no I in team. <laughs> so uh, just before, we actually have a video that's coming uh, quite soon, um, which will sort of set the tone for a lot of the less the rest of the live stream. Um, but just before, we'll just answer a couple of questions. So, uh, Revert Cheva has asked, what did you all do for work before you joined WAF? Well, I've never worked in my entire life. I mean, I'm 68, I'm still deciding about what sort of career I'm gonna pursue when I'm old enough. As for Tom, Tom, tell us what you did. He just laughed. <laughs> it was just a laugh. Um, what did I, well, I don't, I don't work for WAF, I'm just, um, I'm just here for, the, here for the fun of the live stream. No, before, what do you do before, you know, when, yeah. how do you so get I, into where, what you're I, doing um, now? Uh, I, I work in sports media at the moment um, and have done for years because I couldn't think of any better to do. <laughs> <laughs> Your boss will be very <laughs> pleased to hear that. They'll <laughs> all be going, oh, see, what's going on here? <laughs> Tom, come and see us. So, yeah, but so, I mean, that's quite awkward. Like any job nowadays, it's very, any job I think you do wherever is very all consuming. So you tend to have less and less time. I know when I started work in London, you had that blissful three hours. You had an hour and a half journey in the morning, an hour and a half journey at night on a train. You didn't have mobile phones. You couldn't do anything. So that's when I actually wrote my first book. And the hour and a half on the way up to London, I'd write a chapter. Hour and a half on the way down, I'd write a chapter. But now it's just so frenetic. You get in your car. You can speak on your phone with Bluetooth. You get in a train. You can be doing your normal work. We do need, as a species, just to learn to slow down. And Tom says, you know, when he goes out in, into nature and just sits down for a few minutes and watches, that's what it's all about, guys. It's finding that downtime. We don't need a lot of it, but we just need it a bit more often than we're getting at the moment. How's, how's that for synopsis, Tom? Does that work for you? Very good. And I was thinking all the way through that, how incredible it is with that pace of life that we've all created that, that you guys still get as many volunteers as you do giving up as much time as they do for, for, for what you do and what you do for the world like. That's because they're all mad like us. I mean, you've <laughs> got to be mad to work here. Insanity really helps. I think that was Stephen Fry's thing on, on one of our TV series, but insanity really helps. I mean, they're, they're just insanely dedicated. I mean, wildlife is, I say this every time, but I can't mean it more. Without these volunteers, we wouldn't be able to do anything, to be honest, let alone a tenth of what we do. We couldn't do anything at all. So their time they give up for us, 
I'm glad they love it, I hope they love it, but we certainly need them more than they ever need us. I mean, nobody's ever needed me. I'll just get my hanky out now. I'll be fine in a minute, guys. Here's a good one. Um, uh, what are your phobias? My phobias? Have you got any, have you got any, any, uh, any animal phobias? Yeah, lorry. Snakes. Very, I'm phobic about lorry. Um, you don't like snakes. I don't, it's, no, this, we've got to get this right. I don't, I'm very nervous working with any animal that I, I've never come across before. So the first time I ever went out to um, uh, Belize, we went out, we arrived on the plane, and the lovely thing about going to film with new people is we've never met them. We've probably had one or two conversations on the phone and we got off the plane and within five minutes, we were just talking as if we'd known each other forever. There's some sort of connection between people who rescue wildlife, whether you're in in Belize or whether you're here and there's a picture on the screen now of me meeting them but within five minutes of meeting we were chatting as if we'd known each other forever but I'm nervous of course I'm I've never worked with crocodiles or alligators or that type of creature ever before and you know if you've got a bit of sense you don't go and do something which you're not used to which is why when we started here you know you start off on the smaller animals and you work up very slow you know what they're going to do you get a feel for it and you know we went out that first day to a 16 foot crocodile and I was bricking it. I'll be dead honest. I was I absolutely I bricking it. I don't think that counts as a phobia, does it? That's a phobia, yeah. That's I was, not, not I was really scared. Fear, I was <laughs> really scared. <laughs> I don't have any phobias yeah. apart from that. No, I'm scared of some animals, but I, if I work with them for a while, I get used to what I can do and what I can't do. And some things I will do straight away. Other things I will watch an expert do it before. Once I've seen somebody do something once or twice, I'm pretty normally good at doing it. Phobias? I don't know. I've got any phobias. I can't think of any phobia that really is not an animal related, just scared because I've never worked with the species before. I think I'm, I'm phobic less, Tom. Have you got any phobias? Uh, animal, I don't like cockroaches. I've got a real, uh, that, and that's an irrational one. We shouldn't it's invite them in. You the shouldn't invite them in. The noise they make. One of the worst nights sleep I ever had was, um, uh, was in, um, in Vietnam. I just, just got into bed in this, in this kind of shack um, in the middle of nowhere and felt a thud on the pillow next to me and turned around and there was there was a, a cockroach that in my mind now in the memory was a, was about the size of my head just sitting there staring at me. Tom has got a very small head, I just like to say that now while we're on his tiny, head. tiny head Tom's got. <laughs> um, so, Laurie, presumably for you it's, it's the, um, the, the flying vampire otters. He's not listening, look, he's gone quiet. Yeah. So Tom no. said, Laurie, Tom said flying vampire otters are your phobia. Would oh, you yeah, be correct? Definitely, definitely. And misspeaking on live streams is my other phobia mm. because it yeah. will come back to haunt you for the entire <laughs> rest of your existence on the planet. That's part of the fun. That's part of the fun. Um, somebody <laughs> said on, on the chat here he doesn't like grass snakes. I don't mind grass snakes at all. What I don't like about grass snake, if I haven't got a pair of plastic gloves on, is my hands will stink of garlic for about the next three weeks when you pick one up. Um, yeah, I, I, I don't think I have any phobias. I, I would, Laurie, you correct them if you like. You can you can weaken me and tell me tell them what what you know about me that I don't. Can you think of any yes. phobias I've got? You you don't do heights, but I think that one's quite quite well known. That's just called age, Laurie. That that's Ooh. called mortality. You you also you, you have a you have quite a phobia of putting volunteers into potentially dangerous situations. I'm all that for one that. you do have a phobia of. <laughs> yeah, I got, it's a great verb. It makes great filming. It'll go viral. I always say to Laurie, if anything, anybody gets into trouble, don't stop filming. I've even said with me, if I'm going to die on a rescue, Laurie, don't stop filming or I'll no. fire you. He's genuinely because... said that to me on the first <laughs> week I was here. That, that's true. how this place works. Well, when, you, when he had that badger fall, he said to me, are you still filming? Are you still filming? Yeah. Are we all more worried about him? <laughs> don't worry about me. I'll deal with me. It's fine. Everything's fine. No, I, I don't think I have any phobias, to be honest. I, I'm scared of things that I'm not used to, and I need to be unscared of them. But that's just practice. That's just learning. Like the time in Belize, by the time we left Belize... I was able to jump on a crocodile and grab it. In fact, the only funny time we had in that entire rescue was we'd rescued about a 14-foot crocodile. You put, a, you put a noose out by, by the edge of a big lake, you dangle a bit of chicken on a snare in front of that noose because they're so used to being fed. So this crocodile came out, grabbed hold of the chicken. The noose was ready, rather like we, I did with the fox with, with Laurie. The noose was ready to go. Noose tightened up. Um, 
I can't remember his name. It's highly embarrassing now. I will think of it in a minute because he's a lovely, lovely guy. He and his wife were superb. I love them to bits. They ran, they run Aces uh, Crocodile Rescue in Belize, and he grabbed it. We got on it. I had learned to jump on the back and to grab its back leg so it can't run away. And then for some, and then we tied it to one of the vehicles so it couldn't escape too much. But suddenly they forgot I was on it. So everybody got off and was sort of chatting. They were chatting to the camera crew, and I was still sitting on the back of this bloody crocodile. And it started walking off towards the lake. And its front legs were working. I was going, hey, guys, guys, I'm still here, guys. Um, so that's where it gets a bit dodgy. And that was the only dangerous time I had. It couldn't have actually bitten me because when you do grab a croc like that, you get above its head, you put its head down because the jaws are very strong when they shut. They're not so strong to open. So if you get your hand above its head and go down on, on the front of its head like that, you can keep the door sh draw jaws shut. You then wrap insulation tape around its mouth to stop it doing you any damage, and that's fine. But what you've got to remember is don't let it go until you've cut that insulation tape off, which they didn't do, to be honest. But, you know, they'd all got off it, and I was on the back going, Ooh, I'm going for a swim with a crocodile. Not so much fun, guys. And what, were you, what, were you what were you rescuing the crocodile from? <coughs> There's a lot of... It's not, it's not a sort of animal that you think would need to <coughs> No, they don't. I mean, what happens in places like Belize is a lot of, it's a big tourist attraction. So all these guys go around, you know, the people who want to earn the odd five bucks, you know, they'll take the tourists around, they get a crocodile out of the water by dangling, they throw a bit, you know, chicken on a bit of rope, they chuck it in the water, then they drag it out. The croc obviously knows it's food, they get used to this happening, so they come out to sort of grab the food. Um, but obviously then, you know, somebody else will be walking down there 10 minutes later with their dog. The dog would go too close to the lake and, and the dog's its dinner. So, you know, people get, they habituate wildlife. These crocodiles learn that when somebody's walking around the lake, um, you know, there was going to be food there. And this is why you have to be so careful. You've got to learn to respect animals. And a crocodile is just doing what it does. I mean, it can't go into Tesco and say, I'd like a couple of your chickens, please. That doesn't work. So they're only being natural, but then we then hate them and we try to shoot them and kill them because they're coming into our world actually guys what we've done is gone into their world it's never been the other way around ever so this is why we need to respect wildlife we need to learn that we need a food chain that works the food chain's everything um and i keep talking about it all the time so you it's one you don't all sign out actually when i talk about food chain but it is vital it's the most important part of our world i mean tom you've got young kids haven't you what sort of age are your children uh, they're both under 10. Both under 10. Do you worry for their future? Um, well, yeah, I'm, I'm their father. I think they're <laughs> I worry about how they're going to do all the time. Um, uh, I think I think they are going to grow up with very, very, very different challenges to those to the ones that we grew up with. Um, and I guess my my fear for their generation is that is that our generation and the generations before take things past a tipping point and, and we get to a point where uh, where we can't um, undo the damage that we've done environmentally. It's tragic. I mean, I talk about this all the time. Tom is turning into me a little bit. It rather scares me. I mean, he will be saying I dot, I dot, I dot food chain in a minute. Um, yeah, but I, I think it's terrifying for the kids. We've set them the most daunting task. And to be honest, we said it. I'm the generation that set it, but I was I never realized when I was younger. We did our sort of pond dipping and all the things we do for nature. But nobody ever said, look guys, we need to be doing this or this or we shouldn't be doing this or this. It was just accepted that it was right. It's only now, perhaps it's old age that's made me think it more, but it's only now that we've really come to an absolute awareness that we've done irreparable damage. We can slow it down hugely, I hope. Um, over the coming generations, but I don't think we can get rid of it entirely. So our kids have got a mammoth task undoing the damage that we've done. I mean, I always say now I get myself into a lot of trouble and here comes the trouble now. Laurie's probably going to block his ears and run away. Is there's only one invasive species on this planet nowadays and that's man. Sorry guys, there's too many of us and we're too selfish. We're short-sighted, we're greedy. We've got to give something back. I mean, nature's really tough. You look at nature and this animal eats that animal and that animal eats that animal, but they all live there in their space. They all get a lifespan, be it good or bad. Some are quicker than others, which is why, you know, the survival of the fittest, but it works. 
and they don't go and kill 50 of something just because they want to. Um, they eat what they need and they pass it on to the next one. And the food chain works and evolves in that way. And we need to respect that and we need to be a bit more respectful of our planet because the planet doesn't need us. We need the planet. So how do, so how do, we, um, how do we educate people better? How do we educate children better? And how do we balance that with, um, uh, with keeping animals in captivity, for example? Oh, that's not a subject. Laurie will, <laughs> Laurie will be hiding his face at the moment. We don't talk about animals in captivity because that'll be a five, a five-hour rant by Simon about animals in captivity. Um, a, we shouldn't keep animals in captivity. I agree. We've got domestic species, and people say, "What about cats and dogs and budgerigars?" We've done that. We can't undo it, but we, what we mustn't do is go any further. I mean, we've got to respect what we have. We've, you see, there's a note from, there's a note from Laurie. Um, yeah, animals in captivity is wrong. You keep in the car. I mean, we still always say at Wild Aid, the best cage we have here is the empty cage. I, we've got the animal in, we've dealt with it, and we've got it back out of the wild again. But to try to get them to grasp this nettle, I think, although I, there's lots of things I hate about social media, I think the power of one is far more powerful, for want of a better word, than ever before. You know, normally if I wanted to get a message out, you'd write some letters, you'd ring a few people. You couldn't get further than that unless you were some huge television host with some TV show. Now you can. You can sit on your YouTube or your Twitter or whatever you're doing and you can get your message out there. And I think that's the benefit of social media. I've always said regarding money for this place, you know, in the very, very old days, I'm sure charities, some charities have got a million quid from one person. That's a thing of the past, guys. It's not going to happen anymore. So what you need to work on now is you need to get one pound from a million people. So you need to reach out to people, not only to the charities need money from people, but we need to make them understand that the vital importance, if they want to survive, if mankind wants to survive, then we've got to treat the planet and everything around us and everything that provides for us in a respectful manner. And I'm now going to get off my soapbox so I can feel me beginning to rant even more than normal. So an equally hard hitting question from Flutterby 0704. Uh, can Simon do a good Southern American accent? <laughs> Um, Laurie and Andrew will tell you here that I have Why? one accent, we, which, going, actually, which actually Why? goes from, it's a bit of Irish in there, there's a bit of Indian, there's a bit of American, um, I, I, I can't it's even do good. it, now I'm thinking about it, I can't do a good accent. How are you doing there guys? I don't know what that was, that what could have been that? anything. What that, could have been, <laughs> that was you just sounding vaguely offensive. <laughs> I've upset everybody and I'm really, really sorry. And if anybody wants to teach me um, a good American accent, I'd be happy to learn. I think I'd be we should go to a video. To I think we should watch a video, should yes. we? Yes. On that note, <laughs> we're just going to take a, a little segue. So before we go into the video for tonight, I'm uh, just going through a few more of the donations. Um, so we've had Laura Keynes donated £2. Thank you very, very much. Uh, Matus has donated 25 Polish Zloty. Thank you very much for that one. Uh, Alina Harris has donated £9.99 with a thank you. Thank you so much for your support. Uh, Sven, of course, has donated 100 euros. You are amazing as always, Sven. Uh, Scottish Astronomer, £25. And has put, is there any way to get books from your shop autographed by Simon? A, burp, a burst pipe destroyed all my books, including the ones you sent me. I'm really sorry to hear that one. Um, I'll tell you, Scottish sure Astronomer, because you're so lovely to us. Um, I'm going to send you both. Uh, how many books? I think you've got two, but just go back on the live chat. Um, I will send you two copies, free of charge, with my love, and signed. But we d won't ask Laurie to sign them, because that'll cheapen them far too much. Okay. Nobody wants so, my so, signature. So you, you can see my writing's terrible. Absolutely, yeah, his writing's awful. <laughs> so, yeah, please just send us an email. So, media at wildlife aids.org.uk um, with your address and we'll sort that one out. I'm really right. sorry to hear Laurie, we've got to go to this video because we're going to run out of time and we're all going to be in trouble. We do. So, so are we uh, going to have a like quick look at this? this video? Yeah, so this video, tell them what it's about, Laurie. <laughs> so, uh, for those of you who know, we had a series on TV, Wildlife SOS, for 16 years and Simon being the incredibly uh, lucky man that he was at the time and that is not coming from jealousy. It definitely is. Uh, got to travel abroad to see how a lot of other wildlife rescues do their thing. So this is a quick montage of what you saw.
Okay, I think we're live again. Oh, I, the memories from there. My, I was talking to Tom while it was on, just giving a running commentary. I, I was, A, I was so lucky. B, it was such a privilege to be able to go and see all these people work. Vincent and Sharia, I apologise for you getting your name because you were the most lovely people. Uh, we went to Virunga, we went out to the Democratic, Congo, Democratic Republic of Congo to see the mountain gorillas and the team out there with the gorilla vets were just absolutely stunning. So everybody I've worked with, their hearts are right in the right place. It makes me feel totally inadequate, to be honest, with the sort of things we deal with. It was beautiful. I loved every single minute of it. I'd love to do it again. Um, and I've been so lucky. Um, Dave, as uh, Ricky Gervais once said, I'm sure I've said this before on live stream, um, we did a bit with Ricky Gervais and he turned around to the camera because I let out a swear word, which you know I'm, I never do. And he, we had to leave it in because he said, Simon Cowell is just like David Attenborough with Tourette's. And it's just it's true. It's so true, guys. Um, so there we are. I've been so fortunate. We've been all over the world, not everywhere yet. Still places I'd like to go to. But to see these people being as passionate as we are about what we do, this is what makes my world tick and what makes me keep doing for British wildlife what all these people are doing for wildlife the world over. Very lucky to meet them, made some amazing contacts and we still speak to each other now if I want something or need something in any other country, we can actually speak right across and get to the, 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 the nub of the problem straight away. So everybody I've worked with, thank you. Um, anybody who wants to do a new TV series, I'm ready, willing and able, slightly insane, slightly incontinent, but still ready to do it. So thank you all so much for inviting me into your world. And what it taught me without any doubt, which is why we've now do try and do more education now, is whichever country you go to, the species obviously are all wildly different, dangerous, not dangerous, whatever, but the problems are the same. And the problems are, without doubt, mankind, either indirectly or directly. So we need, I always say it, to respect this planet and to put something back. So we don't put it back, we'll take it all until there's nothing left. Tom, take me off this line of thought immediately. Um, hedgehog hospitals. Hedgehog hospitals. Do you need a license to run a hedgehog hospital? No, you don't. Not in this Next country. question. That's, that's, in the that's, US. The, that's the reason I was here. Just to add that oh, there we are. See, that's a question. Um, we overwinter about 200 hedgehogs. What I would say to anybody who's thinking of doing it very seriously, <coughs> you need to go on a, quite a serious course. You need to refer to wildlife hospitals. There's a lot of treatments hedgehogs need. And, you know, you can't learn it all on a one-day course. You need to sort of spend a long time learning about the species, learning what the species needs. And some will always be different. They're such great creatures. I mean, the one on the screen at the moment is a little baby. Um, but they look like very old men when they're just born. They look a bit like me, which is quite sad, actually. It's all wrinkly like me. I, I don't think I want to see that picture again, Laurie. It upsets me. <laughs> Somebody say something. What else have we got, Laurie? Red kite in pink. Can someone tell me what red kite imping is? Red kite imping is a procedure where a bird has flown into something or damaged its wings or its tail feathers in some appalling way. Um, those feathers will not get right until it molts again, which could take up to a year. But what you can do is cut the shafts of feathers off quite low and you can take feathers from a deceased kite, same species, and glue them in. So you glue them into the old shafts and that bird, instead of being with us for months, is with us for a week or two while we put, give it new feathers. And those feathers will stay there. The imp feathers will stay in until it does its next molt and then it will grow its own feathers back. So amazing procedure. Mary was very good at it. She's done so many now, she could probably do them in her sleep um, and very successful. Is that not so, Laurie Braley? <laughs> He's gone to sleep, hasn't he? He's I, I've on. not gone to sleep. I'm, I'm just letting you talk. Well, you never normally let me talk. You normally shut me up in two seconds. So any other questions coming no in words. that we've ignored there, there so badly? There are a lot tonight. of questions. Um, so a couple on the montage. Uh, a few people are asking, why did you have to wear a mask around the gorillas? Because the diseases that gorillas get, chimpanzees get, monkeys get, get um, are transferable man. It's a zoonotic thing. So if we're working with gorillas or whatever, um, we need to wear masks because we don't want to pass our infections on to them because they're very close to our species. So um, anybody going out to see gorillas, even if they, you're told you don't need to, should always wear a mask because you don't want to did pass you, your infection on to other animals. Did you, did you have to learn the gorilla noise as well? Um, 
There's such an answer I could give to that, Tom, but I won't. I didn't learn the gorilla noise. In fact, the only thing I remember so well from that tour, A, we had to track about three 3,000 metres up some mountain, and I thought I was going to die. And in fact, the vet turned around to the camera crew at one point and said, Simon's gone very green. Do you think he's going to make it? And Jim, Jim just went, this is the camera, and just went, yeah, he'll be fine. And just went on, leaving me going, Ugh. But we got there. It was a bit of a rainy day, but you just got to within... So nine foot of a full mountain gorilla. And Jim said, well, say something to the camera. There's this gorilla face, which was about that big in my eyesight. And I just went, God, its face is huge. He said, well, say something. God, its face is huge. He said, say something that's useful. And I was so overawed by this amazing creature and so gentle. They're not scared of us. They've seen very few humans in their life and they've had its, the silverback had its family around them. You have to learn what you mustn't do ever is point like that so if you point to something i got into trouble a couple of times so i forgot and you know you don't point to them because they think it could be a gun so you you know they don't need to learn that but you just need to learn respect just stand in your space they won't attack you um providing they're not threatened and they're just so magnificent they're so close to us um and they're so persecuted i mean there's so much uh, poaching and unpleasant things going on in the democratic republic of congo I can't even say that. I'll say that later on when I've had another drink. Um, but there, where we were, in Virunga, um, in fact, the guy who runs it is a, a Belgian prince who is the most amazing guy. He was so, so selfless in what he did. He spends all his life out there trying to save these mountain gorillas. Um, and he was actually shot in the summit. There's a big news thing about it. A load of times. I've forgotten how many. Laurie might remember. But it was multiple times in the stomach when they were ambushed. And yet he went into hospital and he was back out with his gorillas probably within about a month. I mean, I must admit, if that happened to me, I'd be very, I'd have second thoughts about going out there to do it again. But what a lovely, lovely guy he was, has my absolute respect. His name was Emmanuel de, Mo, de, de Marode. Um, and, you know, if you can give some money to that group, they really deserve it. Stunning work. But everybody, everywhere we go does stunning work. Like, you know, it'd be very hard to define who should get the money. They all deserve it. Amazing people. So in terms of uh, the trips you had abroad, did you notice anything that was different or similar to how we work here? Or is there some sort of fairly regular thing that a lot of these centres will adopt? I think the funniest thing is the kit. I mean, the things we use to catch things, how we catch things, the methods we use, or absolutely, considering none of us at those stage in our lives have ever talked, we use the same sort of kit. Um, you know, you get something, get stuck in something, you use either a grasper or you get your sort of little hooky things. We all use the same sort of tools. Um, and it, it's just fascinating to watch it. It's just funny to know that we've all developed it in our own time, in our own way. Um, the only thing I have shown to people which we hadn't ever seen abroad before was when you get a, a deer or an animal like that stuck in a narrow gate, as opposed to having to cut all the gate to pieces, you slide in your aluminium sheets and that sort of spreads the point of load and you can get that animal back out again so i have given a little bit to world conservation in a very tiny way so small guys you can't even see it no i said yeah, no you're, you're kind of your lucky grasper. no we don't have lucky graspers i have a lucky lorry so if anything ever a rescue is complicated i just say lorry i think you should learn on this one which actually means I've no idea how to do this lorry you, and, and you have a go. And I don't want to call under that traffic Yeah, matter. and then when he gets it wrong, I can shout at him for getting it wrong, thinking, I'm glad I didn't have to do that. But no, we don't have favourite kit. We have bits of kit we use a lot. Grass is obviously quite commonly used. We've got hedgehogs down drains. We've got our alligator uh, forceps, which we use. Um, and then we develop bits of kit. I mean, the, I suppose one of the most complicated bits of kit had developed. There's a magpie stuck about 15 feet down the woman's chimney. There was a fire at the bottom, it was on a nest, and we had no idea how to get it out. So in the end, I, I went to the woman, I said, you haven't got anything like a soup ladle, have you? She said, yeah, I've got a soup ladle. So I got a soup ladle. I sort of strapped it onto a long, long bamboo pole that was in the garden with some gaffer tape. And I sort of put this down, I got it under the chick and lifted the chick out like a mini nest with a soup ladle. So that was my favorite bit of kit that day. But whatever we need, we use. The, the thing, to me, the thing that rocks my boat is not only rescuing a wild animal that you know would die if you hadn't rescued it, but it's working out how to do it. And that's the most exciting thing to me, because you go into any rescue, you've no idea 
actually what you're going to need until you get there. You've no idea what the animal is going to do when you do get there. It's just working all this stuff out. And to me, that absolutely rocks my world. Yeah. <laughs> no, no words I think we can say to that one. That's very well put. Um, so just going over a couple of donations and then we'll go into a short quick fire question thing again to try and get through some of the questions that uh, you've been asking in the chat. So firstly, uh, Flutterby0704 has donated £2.99 It's put for Simon's Barbados fund provided he brings Laurie. <laughs> no way! As I'd rather I not escape. go! <laughs> Uh, the Warren has donated 25 euros in support. Whilst I don't want to uh, contribute to the Bacardi or Coke or Barbados fund, I will donate to the Simon Sea Cow fund so that maybe someday he can go swim with them again. I have to say, manatees were probably one of them your favourite things to do, weren't they? They were. They were absolutely beautiful. They're so serene. They're, they're so damaged because of people with jet skis and everything else. People just don't think they ride over the weekend. They go down there, they go where the manatees are, and they've got great big propeller marks down their back. Like most wildlife, it, it's badly abused. Not always intentionally, but unintentionally as well. And we just need to protect what we've got. Manatees are so beautiful. They come up to you. You're not allowed, if you're doing it properly, you're not supposed to go near them. You wait for them to come to you. And they swim up to you, they look at you, they turn over on their backs and you just scratch their stomachs and they sort of smile in a manatee sort of way. Would you rather how Laurie smiles really? It's a bit of a manatee way that Laurie smiles. And then they swim off. Beautiful. I mean, it's, I've felt so privileged doing some of the things I've done. I honestly could not have been luckier if I tried. Right, Tom, you said very little tonight. We'll have to have Tom back because the poor chap has hardly got a word in edgeways tonight. So I've been a, a bit too over-talkative, I feel. I'm, I'm waiting for, uh, for Laurie to pick out the rest of the questions. Go on, Laurie. What's that, sorry? Oh, she's not even listening to us, Tom. I, I am. Up, it's just it? you're very, very faint in my ear at the moment. Well, that's quite must be quite nice for you, Laurie, for me to be faint in your ear. No, you're quite um, loud. That's Tom bad said, thing. let's have a few quick fire questions because you know very well that my daughter and deputy CEO is going to get really cross with us if we run over too much past the hour. She gets so angry. Mm -hmm. we, we have actually been allowed to uh, go over the hour. We've been given her blessing on that one. By who? But, by Lou. Oh, by heavens above. Go on then, ask <laughs> me some quick fires. So, Quick fire questions. Izzy's asked, when was your most recent deer rescue? Pass. Laurie, answer that question. I can't think. <laughs> Sadly, we, we, we do multiple ones a week. Sadly, a lot of them yeah. are RTAs or anything like that. I can't remember off the top of my head when the last one was, but it wouldn't have been too long ago. It was within uh, a week or so. Sadly, as Laurie says, a lot of them, sadly, are RTAs have got severely broken bones or broken backs. We can't always save them, but at least we can give them the dignity uh, of being put to sleep quite quickly rather than live for maybe weeks, certainly days, but often weeks without being able to feed or move and just horrible, horrible way to go. Darwin has asked, what made you get into saving wildlife? Um, I've always loved animals. I mean, this is a story I've done a million times before, but cutting a long story short, always wanted to be a vet, far too thick, worked in the city, got thrown out the city because I had a couple of nervous breakdowns. So I went back to doing what I think I wanted to do and that is looking after wildlife. Did it all by mistake, never intended to do it really, but it just went from there and it's grown and grown and grown. And I'm so fortunate now to be the CEO of quite a successful wildlife hospital in the UK with of staff and volunteers who for some unknown reason put up with my rants, my raves, my grumpiness, my bad moods, but we're all here for one reason only, and that's for the wildlife. So guys, thank you all, and that's why I do it. A few people have asked, have you ever met David Attenborough? No, I have spoken to him once on the phone. I've spoken to his daughter a couple of times because we wanted him to do something for us. Sadly, he wouldn't do it, so we won't go dwell on that one too much. But what an amazing guy. He's had a very lucky life. He's been paid quite well for it, I guess, over the years, which is uh, more than I can say about me. But no, what an amazing life. I mean, he, he probably knows more than I will ever know, even if I read the Encyclopedia Britannica. Very, very knowledgeable man. Uh, Flutterby0704 has asked, have you ever helped any animals give birth? Yeah, lots of times, sadly. Uh, not only when I was in my farming days. In fact, here's a funny story. It's, I think it's all right for YouTube. I've got to be a bit careful now. But it was my first week. I was going to be a farmer. All my family were farmers. So I went down to do my year's practical training before going to college <laughs> and I was sitting there, you know, a bit of a, you know, Surrey boy, not really knowing what it was all about, but I'd been on 
around farms all my life, but obviously farms around here are mainly arable. There's not a lot of, of uh, cattle farming around here. So I was in the middle of Sunday lunch, and, and my cousin said to me, oh, this cow's giving birth, I can hear it, you know, it's straining over there, we better go and do it, Simon. So off we went, off I trotted out, we got up on the table, I had my suit on, I looked very posh, I looked really quite smart. Um, so off we went, so this cow gave birth, it was quite a difficult birth, we had to pull it off with carving ropes, um, and that was quite a bit of a struggle, it was about half an hour in, and I was standing there so pleased with myself, this calf came out, everything was great, so I was standing at the rear end of the cow as it all happened, thinking, Oh, what a great life and then the afterbirth from this cow came out it slid down my suit into my wellington boots and i just stood there going hmm lesson learnt so uh, in are. terms of at the center we've actually had uh hedgehogs give birth here um we've had to do a cesarean on a fox that video is actually on the channel uh, if you want to have a look at that we've seen uh we've done cesareans on deer unfortunately uh that was post-mortem on that one uh, we've we've seen quite a lot, a lot of uh, rodents giving birth as well. We had a, a pregnant slow worm in earlier this week. It does happen uh, quite a lot. So yeah, lots. You get to see the most amazing things. I mean, you know, if anybody has seen even a, a sheep giving birth to lambs, its birth is pretty damn phenomenal. I mean, it really is the most amazing event. And when you think how it all starts from just two little cells joining together to something coming out of that animal, whatever it is, it's nature is very clever incredibly clever never knock it guys because it's what's keeping us alive today a uh, few people are asking what's the best thing to do for their local hedgehogs uh, and on the same note reverts has asked why is the uh, the hedgehog population now in decline um we've been here a few times before so i'm going to try and make it really brief it's declined because of mankind be it roads poisons insecticides everything that causes any wild animal to decline the big thing we can do now is provide habitat for them. So if you're in a, a garden which has got fences, cut a little hole because hedgehogs need to travel. They need to go back and forth to get food. They certainly need to go back and forth at that certain time of year to find a Mrs. Hedgehog to go with a Mr. Hedgehog. We do hope they get married first. Um, so, yeah, we've got to give them habitat. I mean, I think the biggest problem we have in this country now is wildlife corridors. They're far and few between. In fact, it is said that the best and best the only best wildlife corridor we've got in the southeast of England now is people's back gardens. And that's pretty sad. We need to keep um, habitat for wildlife. I know they say that hedgehogs will go extinct in this country within the next few, uh, next 10 or 15 years. I actually think they're wrong. I think urban extinction is an absolute certainty, but I think there are enough green and rural areas where hedgehogs will survive. The population will be diminished. It's already down 96%. Damn it, it can't get much worse, guys. But with a bit of work, you know, everybody says, well, why do you take a hedgehog through the winter? What odds is it? You know, you saving 100 hedgehogs is nothing. Um, but we had one of our, our young ladies, Helen, who's a bit of a mathematician, spend months working out with all the unknowns and all the difficult things that if we saved 100 hedgehogs over the winter, in 10 years' time, that 100 hedgehogs could become 35,000 hedgehogs. So if every wildlife hospital in the UK did exactly that for the next 10 years, you can all work out that we could begin to get that population back. So that's why every single creature is important. It's not for what you're doing for it now, but it's for what you're providing, the possibilities for the future. This is all a bit uh, deep for me, Laurie, tonight. It's gone far too deep. You are, deep it's getting me. quite deep this evening. <laughs> uh, so, Zscribe says, did the TV show ending hurt um, our bottom line in terms of donations? Um, we never really know where donations come from. I think it probably did. Um, it was great, you know, but, you know, people who watched the TV series all these years ago, you know, legacies might still be coming through from them now. But I think the one thing that saddens me most of all is when you get a legacy and somebody leaves you a considerable sum of money, you can't ring them up and say thank you. And I find that quite sad. <coughs> Sorry, cracked on that one, guys. Get myself back together. It would be lovely to be able to say to everybody before they die, thank you so much for thinking of us. Um, so we get a lot of donations in still, um, and hopefully the YouTube channel will start to bring donations in in years to come, because they say from when you start asking for legacies, it's often at least 12 years before those legacies come in. So legacies are what keeps charities alive. Uh, don't ever get me wrong, the how bigger much, charities. How much do you reckon it costs to run the centre? 
day. It costs about 1,800 pounds a centre to run the day now. And we're a small centre, we're not big, we don't have a lot of staff, so that's a lot of money. I mean, that's seven, 800,000 pounds a year just to run this little thing here. Um, so a lot of money and, you know, and to, every and to, take, to take your kind of average rescued hedgehog from rescue to, to back out in the wild? That's a very hard question. If you could say every animal we have in, probably on average, and this is off the top of my head without thought, probably cost you 40 odd pounds. We'd probably be not far wrong. I mean, I went out on a rescue with Laurie the other day. We were out for, I think, Laurie, three hours. So you've got the people out of the office, you've got the car journey, the petrol, the running the car anyway. So that one little rescue where we were actually rescuing a hedgehog which had fallen into a, a, a well of a building. I mean, that was probably 50 or 60 quid just to rescue that one hedgehog. Um, I'm not asking people to give us all the money. Of course I'm not. We do it because we love doing it. But that's the sort of cost we had to somehow provide for and get the money back in every year. So we're here next year as well. Whether I'll be here because my voice will have gone by then. Laurie mm -hmm. will I can see Laurie cheering now. Look, thought of my voice going. Look, yeah. that big smile on his face. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Pixie Jane Pickering has asked, have we had any return patients? Um, I think we get the odd one. Uh, we get the odd fox back in and we do tend, often when we get animals in, we do tend to microchip them so we, you know, for re various reasons, for monitoring, for whatever, but we have had a few, but I mean for all the animals we microchip we get very few. We always microchip our badgers every year and our foxes because if one does get run over in the road within a certain period of time it's nice to know whether it's ours or not. Sadly, one or two, a very small percentage of ours do get or do succumb to that injury. But I mean, the nice thing about it, it's like ducklings. If we get, you know, if a, if, if a duck has 12 ducklings, she'll be lucky to get three of those onto maturity. She'll be lucky if she keeps three of them. Whereas if we take 12 ducklings in and rear them here and let them go, you know, probably 11, at least 11 will go back out to the wild. So they stand a far better chance of surviving for a decent time in the future. It would be lovely to track them more accurately, to have the money to do it and the ability to do it without inflicting injury or, or, or weight to the animal. I'd love to know more. Uh, all we can do is what we do and I believe every single life matters and every life we can save is a, a good thing to do. Uh, Kel Storm has asked, do we run any volunteer programmes? Uh, yeah, Alice is the one for this. Alice will now be typing away like a demon because not only Alice is our administration manager, uh, whatever you want to call her, but she actually does everything. She's on duty tonight. She's volunteering on the reception desk because she's just mad. Um, but everybody here who works here is mad. Um, but she's so she works tonight. She, I'm sure she'll answer this. We have, we have volunteers. We do volunteer programs. We have volunteer vets. We have volunteer vet nurses. We're here to advise, help, and whatever. And when we get this new centre, which we've talked not at all about tonight, which is quite sad, um, the whole idea of the new centre is not only so we can do more of what we do now, but so we can go so much further into education. Um, I think it's so important to inspire the younger generation as to why they need wildlife. They're not going to understand why they need wildlife. Why do we need habitat? It's all a load of rubbish, concreted all over. The planet would not survive without our wildlife and our habitat. It would be a very different world and not a very nice world to live in. So, yeah, education's great. When we get the new centre, hopefully um, that will go hugely into education um, and we can show people why it's so important, not only for our sanity, but, but for the sake of the planet. Uh, Pixie Jane Pickering has said, uh, I'm going to salt burn by the sea for a few days. What's the one thing that can be done to help coastal wildlife? I mean, the biggest damage, which we very seldom touch on, and I think it's a massive problem which is going to get bigger and bigger and bigger over the years to come, is pollution of the seas. I don't think we've even begun to realise, I don't think even the scientists have begun to realise the sort of damage we've done to our seas. So anything you see when you're walking down a beach, just take a black bin liner with you, have it in your hand, even if you only pick up three bits of litter on your beach walk, it will make a huge difference because all this will go into the sea. We've got all these, these micro beads going to the sea. We've got so much damage and I don't think we've really begun to realise what sort of damage we've caused. I think it's, it's incomprehensible. So yeah, when you're walking on a beach, just pick up even if it's one bit of litter. I don't care. If you could spend 20 minutes going to pick up a certain area of litter, that would be amazing because it will save wildlife. It will without doubt save a wild animal because that litter has now gone. Uh, 
A few people are asking, um, considering the comments earlier about not needing a license uh, here in the UK to run a rehab centre, um, what are the limits of that? Can you do sort of medication, stitch ups, or anything like that, or is that still restricted? I think it's a conversation which is not destined for here. I'm happy to take somebody who wants to ring me and talk about it, the, the whys and wherefores. I think without doubt, to be successful, you have got to have a vet on staff, but that's incredibly expensive. And then if you've got a vet on staff, you've got to have a vet nurse. There's a lot There's a lot of expense in what we do and a lot of expertise. Obviously, to do our job well, we need a vet to do. I mean, Maru can one minute be imping a, 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 a sparrowhawk. She can be mending a broken leg on a fox or a hedgehog. She has to be ambidextrous in every sense of the word. And she has to be incredibly skilled. And when they come out of vet college, when all these people come out of vet college, they know very little about wildlife care. Um, and it's a, it's a big learning curve. So working, I always say to any vet that comes to work with us here, if you can handle with a vet job here, you could handle any vet job anywhere in the world because ours is so intense. And it's not just seeing the animal and passing it to a vet nurse. They've got to watch that animal right through the center. They've got to know what's going on. They've got to know what's best for it and when to put it back out to the wild again. It's a mammoth job for all our staff here to do what they do. And obviously the vets are supported by, by Alice's team, um, I don't support anybody. I, I just sit here with my head in my hands thinking how we're going to be here tomorrow. But yeah, it, it's a great life, guys. But you've got to be passionate about it. You've got to be devoted to it. And you've got to be basically one-track minded to do it. So, uh, Tom, in terms of uh, your brief introduction to the madness that is wildlife aid, uh, did you have any sort of comments, questions or anything like that that you wanted to uh, discuss? Um, there's one that we missed from who, Huge Five Hairs. Um, why does Simon look like a beautiful duck? I think it's, I think it's I've just been, choked over my coke. I've been thinking that for years. Um, I mean, any, is there any reason that you look like a beautiful duck? Tom, I really have no words. For the yeah. first time this evening, I have no words. But I mean, you've sat here listening to me rant now for about an hour and a quarter. What thoughts do you come out? Seriously, I don't want you to pull any punches now. I mean, you've entered a world which is basically insane, mm. run by an insane man. Yeah. Um, what are your, honestly, your thoughts well, at I this think, point I in think time? Genuinely, my main thought, thought number one, is that is that you really, really need to tidy your desk. That's yes. The, yeah. That's my main takeaway. It's Myra, beautiful, my Myra I know where everything is. It's wonderful. But there are there are papers yeah. on that desk from 2004. What's this, what's this for? This is to pump up our rib. That pumps up our rib when we go out on rescue. Okay. But out of it's all, about the, half a all mile these from things the I've been saying for an over an hour, he comes up with about you know silly things like that's for my dogs. It keeps my dogs happy. It's bones. You know, have you learned anything about wildlife that has enthralled you, excited you, or inspired uh, you? Bats are small. Bats are small. Uh, you love manatees, and hedgehogs are expensive. Those are my three takeaways, I think. Ladies and gentlemen, you can educate some people some of the time. Other people are uneducatable. That's all I can say. Laurie, do you want the last word tonight? <sighs> no, I, I think people in the chat have had the last word by repeatedly saying winged and otter in the same sentence. You're never going to leave that down, you know that. I'm going to have to get on Photoshop. I am going to have to get on Photoshop. I will have to get on one. It's, it's, it's a genuine thing. It's a, if, if you haven't seen one, you've just not been looking hard enough. I, I, think, there's, I think there's an entire internet um, conspiracy that we could start here. I think, yeah, the, the, the think winged otter. The yeah. winged otter. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Save, save the winged yeah, otter. Yeah, they, they lose their wings after they're one, so everyone just uses the old ones. And if we get them to mate with the flying pigs, yeah. that could be Actually, a whole new what, breed. I remember, I, my, um, my <laughs> one of my earliest wildlife memories oh God. Um, was from a children's book that my parents used to read me, where the kids went to the fun fair and won a goldfish um, at, at the fun fair, um, and their, their dad didn't know it was the other way around. They caught a stickleback. Oh, here we go. This could take a long time, this story. So, you know, apologise to everybody. It's going to overrun dramatically. Off you go, Tom. So they caught a stickleback in their local river. Yeah. 
and the dad couldn't stand the thought of keeping the stickleback in, in captivity. Right. Um, so they swapped it for goldfish and didn't tell, tell the children. And I reckon until probably my 15th birthday, I thought that sticklebacks turned into goldfish. Um, okay, guys, I'm going to just vanish from this chat for me. I'm going to leave it to, to Laurie and Tom because I'm needed urgently from Alice. So there's obviously a rescue going on. So forgive me for stepping away, but we're nearly at the end. Laurie and Tom, it's over to you. <laughs> uh, please try and put the, the mic close to you, Tom, if you can hear that. This is, this, this is when we get to talk about it, isn't it? <laughs> this is where we actually get the, the vast majority of what we intended to talk about discussed. <laughs> It's been it's been an absolute uh, it's been a pleasure. Um, thank you for, for letting me on and giving me the opportunity to um, to stand in with it. Yes, it's been great to have you on, and I'm sure uh, we will have you back on on future live streams on that one. Uh, especially reacting to uh, like a couple of the the rescue techniques that Simon's done in the past and things like that would be uh, it's always very difficult because a lot of um, the team here because we've been doing it quite a lot we don't necessarily know um, we assume things are known and not known and then it becomes quite a, a surprise when we realize that people don't know that swan bags exist and that we could just consider that a standard accessory <laughs> and a lot of people don't so uh, it's quite good to get uh, the view of someone who's just come into to this side of it and I apologize for how mad we're going to make you over the course of your tenure with us. <laughs> I look forward to it. <laughs> uh, so, just before we go, guys, um, we have run over quite a lot. Um, do you, any of you have any further questions that uh, you'd like to ask in the chat, and then we will wrap up? Uh, a lot of people are saying winged otters on a t-shirt. We will make it happen. Mark my oh, words, yes. we will make we it happen. We, we will, and I'll be wearing one. I, I won't say anything, I'll just be wearing a winged otter. We, we need to find someone who's good at drawing. Abby's quite good at drawing. Over here. No. She, she'll refuse it, but she is. <laughs> uh, do, you, um, do you guys have a mascot? Unfortunately, no, we don't. Uh, we just use the, the paw print logo. I don't think we get a winged otter past the board, unfortunately. Uh, they tend to be a, a lot more serious <laughs> than, uh, than we are. Uh, having a flip through. Uh, what's the best food put to put out for local hedgehogs? Uh, we don't usually recommend feeding wildlife. Um, we tend not to, it encourages them to not do their natural foraging and feeding behaviours. Um, we only tend to recommend it if the animal is in distress or needs a bit of a boost just to get up. Uh, but in terms of foods for hedgehogs, um, cat and dog food, wet cat or dog food um, is very good to make sure it's not a fish variety. Um, and add in some of the, you know, the dry dog food biscuits or cat food biscuits as well. Just helps to keep their teeth clean. Um, don't feed them on mealworms. Uh, you see a lot of stuff around the internet saying feed, put mealworms out for them. That actually gives them severe nutritional imbalances and can actually lead to metabolic bone disease uh, and a number of other things on that one. So try and avoid mealworms if you can. Uh, anything you've seen in the chat, Tom? I think we, uh, I think we may have exhausted all chat questions as well. <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, rescued any unusual animals this week? So Simon has actually gone through a few of them. Uh, we've done, we've had bats, we've had the slow worms as well, we've had the mole, and a number of other things. Simon is actually starting to reappear. Uh, and on that note, I think we'll start to wrap it up just because Simon's back. So Laurie, here we are, Look, I've just come back Hello. from a situation up at the hospital and um, with no names obviously because I can't, but what an absurd situation. A guy's just arrived with a hedgehog, um, he found it in his garden, he doesn't want it in his garden um, and we should take it away, we should take it away. Uh, things like this, Alice, poor Alice is in tears, um, this guy just does not want to know. Um, and that's the sort of thing sometimes we have to deal with. I mean, he's got a hedgehog in his garden, he doesn't want it. Get rid of it, please. I, I, I despair at mankind sometimes. So perhaps I shouldn't have come in on this. I should have let myself cool down first before I come back into this. But well, that's the sort of thing. Or at least bought the hedgehog. Huh? He, yeah, I suppose he bought the hedgehog and we will put it back in a suitable place. But all these animals know their habitats. They know where they come from. They know where they can forage. They know where food is. If we go and put it, you know, it's like taking you into the depths of New Delhi or something, so you know, sort yourself out, you'd struggle. An animal needs to know where it is, it needs to know its habitat, its area, so it can survive. And uh, poor Alice is at her wit's end because the phone has been non-stop all night. 
So, um, yeah, that's the sort of thing, yeah. the insanities we deal with in this world, folks. And I'm going to sign off again now. Are you nearly signing off between you? Yes, we are. We're needing to wrap up now. Um, so we're trying to end it on a, a happy note. Thank you all so much for watching, tuning in, for all of the donations that have come in. So, so kind of you. As we say all the time, we don't get any government funding. We rely entirely on the generosity of people like you. So thank you so much for all your support. We genuinely could not do anything that we do without you. Uh, and in terms of sign off, Simon, it's over to you. No, I've, I've done it. I think Tom's got the honours tonight. Tom, you say good night and it'll all go black. Good night.